product is released onto the market, it has to go through several lengthy tests, mainly for security and performance, before it can be sent out to the general public. We like to think that this process can yield a higher quality of goods, based on the time and manpower spent on these tests. But sometimes it doesn't end as well as we think. Most of the time this isn't true. Products tend to meet their safety and performance standards without the need for intervention from a government agency. This is most evident in our cars of today. Rarely are fleets of vehicles taken off the road for a factory flaw on the production line due to government regulations and other safety standards. There always comes a time, however, when a vehicle becomes unsafe to drive because of said manufacturer flaw. This flaw has the uncanny nature of moving from a simple drivability issue to, oh my god, I just took out a bus filled with babies because my wheel fell off. Thus begins a spiral of confusion, lawsuits, and headbanging that we like to refer to as recalls. Recalls didn't always exist, believe it or not. In the early 1960s, automobile safety standards were virtually non-existent and fatality rates were on the rise. The opening of motorways and higher speed limits was not only a quicker way to travel from one place to another, but a quicker way to kill off your entire family in the process. It became apparent to government officials that by not setting safety standards for manufacturers, it could greatly reduce the number of votes to sway in their favor for re-election and reduce tax revenue from said voters. Manufacturers soon too realized that by making their vehicles safer, they could continue doing business with their customers if they didn't kill them in the process. So, in 1966, the National Traffic and Motor Vehicle Safety Act was passed. This forced manufacturers to conform to government safety standards and open the door for better ways to control quality. The way it works is simple. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, or NHTSA, has the ability to receive, document, and test complaints involving vehicle problems. If enough instances of a specific mechanical repair or failure occur, the NHTSA has the right to put the issue under investigation. Through numerous tests and inspections, an independent verdict is reached on whether or not the manufacturers should initiate a recall. Now, throughout this whole process, the manufacturer is privy to all of this information and can run their own battery of tests to confirm whether or not there is an issue. They also have the option to begin a recall at any point during the process, even before the NHTSA begins its review. This not only keeps their new line of vehicles trouble-free, but ends up being good PR for them as well. Now this is all well and good, but surely it doesn't always proceed this smoothly, right? Well, yeah. Let me pull a quote from a movie for you. A new car is built by my company that leaves somewhere traveling 60 miles an hour. The rear differential locks up. The car crashes and burns with everyone trapped inside. Now, should we initiate a recall? Take the number of vehicles in the field, A, multiply that by the probable rate of failure, B, multiply that by the average out-of-court settlement, C, A times B times C equals X. If X is less than the cost of a recall, we don't do one. This, as morbid as it is, has some truth to it. Since we live in the United States, our government allows us to challenge every decision and bring it to a higher court for review. If a manufacturer feels that it doesn't need to begin a recall, the NHTSA begins its review. If, by the end of the review that the NHTSA finds that there is a problem, the manufacturer still doesn't have to begin a recall. The matter is then bumped up to federal court, where a judge and jury are presented the cases. Both the NHTSA and manufacturer are given the chance to present their information and arguments, followed by a verdict from the court. If the court rules in favor of the manufacturer, then no action is taken. However, if the court rules in favor of the NHTSA, the manufacturer can still refuse to initiate a recall. The whole system begins to turn into a case of everyone else is wrong except me argument, which only leads to fines in the end. This isn't an old issue either. In 2007, GM refused to issue a recall on 3.5 million full-size GM pickups and SUVs built in 2003 and 2004. The issue in question was a safety concern regarding premature speedometer failure. GM went on record saying that it doesn't view a broken speedometer as a safety issue. They would, however, repair some faulty units if the vehicles weren't over 70k miles. This was not only GM's fault, but the fault of the NHTSA for not taking appropriate actions in the matter. There is also a current recall issue now, involving Toyota and faulty gas pedal designs. Originally, it was speculated that vehicles equipped with floor mats could cause an accelerator pedal to stick. This wouldn't be an issue if the accelerator problem was only confined to vehicles with floor mats, 
but it wasn't. Toyota has gone to recall 4.6 million cars and trucks that could potentially encounter this problem. The issue at hand isn't that they're not doing their job, but refuse to admit that there was an issue since 2002. It's obvious the system isn't perfect, and almost any manufacturer, foreign or domestic, can avoid correcting potential hazards with their vehicles. This doesn't mean that the system doesn't work. Tens of thousands of recalls have been implemented on vehicles since the late 60s, saving God knows how many lives in the process. While it's not ideal, at least it can give us some security in how our vehicles operate. In conclusion, recalls do not equal buses of dead babies.